hope. Yep. So, and, um, and a broad kind of project means a project that we can't do alone in our labs, that we have to do together. It might be because it's big scale, or it might be because it's interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary in a way that we all have to work together. But Brody projects are things that we couldn't do alone and we have to do together. And we do ask that, because otherwise you could do it otherwise. And so we try to do just those things that would, we would add something. Anyway, it is, um, it's a tremendous honor to be here and uh, to share the, the Harvey Prize. And this is actually my first chance to actually be at Technion. It is not my first time in Haifa, but it's my first time at Technion, but I have been a huge admirer of Technion. Of course, being at MIT, which is English for Technion, um, <laughs> you, know, it's, uh, you know, it's very nice to finally get to be here. And so um, I'm giving two lectures. One of the lectures, uh, I think, was subtitled Biology, and one of them is Medicine. And I don't know, you know if there will be much overlap between the two, so I'll touch a little bit at the end on what I'll say tomorrow for those of you who won't be there tomorrow. But I've sort of broken it up into two pieces that are mostly non-overlapping. And so I'm going to work on, I'm going to talk much more about pure biological things today and then um, more about uh, medical things tomorrow. So, um, secrets of the human genome sort of reading from the infinite library of life. Uh, I'm going to try to sketch over the course of, of this lecture. Whoops, I did something bad there. Hang on. Yes, I'm going to try to sketch over the course of this lecture, well, a little bit of the history of this human genome project idea, but mostly what's come of it in the past decade. And I hope pointing to what still is to come, because there's so much that we're finally being able to see, and it points us to the fact that for this next generation, there's just a huge number of fantastic questions that are just being opened up for the first time. So a brief word about the Human Genome Project itself. Uh, it was um, really the first time biology got together and tried to set a goal, some kind of a, a goal that we could accomplish together, that we couldn't accomplish alone, and that would, would make it possible for people to do thousands of things if you had it. I mean, it was really driven by the observation in the 1980s that it was incredibly, incredibly boring and tedious to clone human genes by position. You know, you'd spend five or ten years and tens of millions of dollars and waste lots of time on the part of students, and, and if we had a human genome sequence, it would all go a lot faster. So that was the idea, and after a bunch of debate in the scientific community in the late 1980s, a clear set of goals were laid out. To have first a genetic map of polymorphic markers up and down the human genome that could be used to trace inheritance. A physical lap, map of the overlapping pieces of DNA covering the genome. A sequence map of all the nucleotides, and an annotation of where the genes resided within that sequence, and very importantly, from the beginning, the commitment that all the information would be made freely and immediately available without restriction to people in any country, in industry, or in academia, didn't matter. It required changing the way we did biology. Uh, we had to move from the early days of DNA sequencing behind plastic shields with radioactive nucleotides. Most of this audience is too young to remember it, but some of you remember it, to kind of a high-scale, high-throughput biology. This was a picture of the of the sequencing floor at the Broad Institute at the height of the Human Genome Project. And you see, you know, it looks like kind of a Henry Ford factory with conveyor belts going around and, and lots of machines and relatively few people needed to do this work. Lots of people, you know, with, with the idea of designing and interpreting, but relatively few people actually doing the manipulations. And we were doing, you know, 100,000 samples, uh, sorry, 250,000 samples a day. Anyway, that was a change to how we had to do things. The other was collaboration. It was an international collaboration on a scale we hadn't done before. It involved six countries, the United States, United Kingdom, uh, France, Germany, Japan, and China, and about 20 centers around the world. Our center was the largest of those centers, but it sort of involved everybody regardless, committed to exactly the same goals, that all the information would be made freely and immediately available. So the Human Genome Project, was uh, finished uh, many times. We, it was completed on multiple occasions. Uh, its completion was announced in June of 2000 at the White House. 
It was uh, completed again when an actual paper came out. I tend to prefer publication to simply announcement, but in any case. But that was the, that was the rough draft of the paper in, in 2000, rough draft of the genome 2001. Then it was really truly completed in the sense of a finished sequence of the genome this week, 10 years ago. April 25th, or I guess last week, uh, it's now Monday, but just a few days ago is the actual 10th anniversary of the completion. We chose that date because it was the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Watson Crick paper on the structure of the double helix, and we all thought it would be cool, and it made everybody work really hard to get done by that date. Now, of course, one of the powerful things about, about uh, you know, one of the, in order to get done by that date, we also needed to redefine what it meant to be done, and that meant <laughs> <laughs> that, for example, we had to define what was finished, and of course you still can't really sequence telomeres and centromeres and the ribosomal clusters. So finish meant anything that was clonable at that time and possibly sequenceable. So between a tremendous amount of hard work and the awesome power of redefinition, we were able to complete the sequencing of the human genome by, by April 25th of 2003, and the formal publication was October 20, 2004. So it means we have many occasions to celebrate 10th anniversaries of this. Um, now, I think there was some hope on the part of some that when the Genome Project was done, we could finally get back to business as usual. But it didn't turn out that way, because this notion of being able to create comprehensive pictures of the genome has only grown. Once we had a basal genome sequence on which things could be laid, more and more projects have been organized to collect information and lay it on the map with more and more layers. It's a Google Maps showing, you know, the traffic patterns and where the pizzerias are and all these sorts of things laid on top of the sequence of the human genome. So gene maps and evolutionary conservation maps and chromatin state maps and 3D folding maps and maps of inherited variation and disease association and evolutionary selection and, and the cancer aberrations. Because now, whatever you do, even if you collect fragmentary information, you can lay it on a common scaffold. So this idea of maps is very powerful. The other intellectual change that occurred because of the Genome Project is because of completeness. Once you know you've seen all the genes or all the proteins, you can then recognize them when you see them again based on a small signature. You can make it an expression array or, or a sequence and read little bits of a message and know what gene it must have come from because there's no alternative. Or if you see a small amino acid sequence in the mass spec, it must come from this protein because there are no alternatives. So completeness is really powerful because completeness allows you to use signatures to follow things. So those two notions have been important changes over the last decade. In addition, of course, sequencing itself has undergone an amazing change in this last decade. We were so proud in the course of the Human Genome Project when we managed at our own place to sequence a billion bases of DNA. <coughs> well, this is what's happened. Sequencing costs over the course of uh, about 11 or 12 years is they've decreased by about one million fold. So last year we didn't sequence a billion bases of DNA, we sequenced 300,000 billion bases of DNA at our place. Um, the costs have fallen about a million fold, give or take, which is very good. I know few things in life that have become one million fold cheaper over the course of a decade or so. Um, it actually, you know, has run ahead of Moore's Law. In fairness, we're cheating because we're using a lot of the power that Moore's Law had been building up and pent up power of Moore's Law, but it's still stunning. So I'm going to try to talk about what are the implications of all of this. And today I'm going to mostly focus on functional elements in the human genome and some of the evolution of the human genome. And in particular, I'm going to say a lot about a particular class of genes we've been having fun with lately called long intergenic non-coding RNAs. And I'm going to go through that. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about inherited disease and cancer. So let's just dive right in. So understanding the genome, what have we learned over the last decade or so? Well, to do it, I have to give you roughly a sense of what did we know that we could build upon. So here's what we knew for sure at the time of the publication of this paper here that you brought with you. What we knew was that the number of protein coding genes was somewhere between 35,000 and 120,000, although it was hotly debated exactly where that was, but it was in that interval. We knew that for a typical gene, the protein coding information was large compared to the regulatory information. There was a promoter and a little bit of, of regulatory sequence at the front. 
We knew that there were a few weird genes that encoded RNAs that were never translated into proteins. There were about a dozen or so known. And we knew the genome was littered with transposable elements and that they were junk. Uh, they, were, they were parasites on the, on the human genome. So what more have we learned? Well, what we've learned, which represents real progress, is that all of those statements are wrong. <laughs> That's scientific progress there. So uh, let's see, how did we find out that all of this stuff, I teach introductory biology at MIT, and all of these statements which I taught my students are incorrect. So um, one of the most powerful tools is evolutionary conservation. From the point of view of reading a human genome, we really need to be able to compare it to something. So the first thing we wanted was the mouse. So we got a sequence of the mouse and lined up to the human and the mouse. Then we got the mouse and the rat and the dog. And we were learning even more by that comparison. And then we got now almost, I guess, 50 vertebrate genomes and have lined them up against each other. And by the virtue of the fact that something that's really functionally important is conserved by evolution at a much higher rate than background, we were able to see things that we couldn't see before. One of them is genes. There really are a lot fewer protein coding genes than advertised, many fewer than Wall Street was promised by the companies that were uh, trying to sequence the human genome, you know, and, and, and we're saying, oh, there are going to be 120,000 new genes to patent or something. So that's about 21,000, I think it's about 20, 21,500 is our best guess right now, of protein coding genes in the human genome. And you can tell by the evolutionary signature. If something's protein coding, it doesn't, it, it shows certain resiliency. It doesn't have deletions that are multiple, that are not a multiple of three very often, et cetera. It's a very clear signature. And now it's very, you know, the more sequencing in, in all people do, they find a few more genes here and there, but that's about right. But at the same time, it's very clear that even though these protein coding genes are few and constitute only about 1.2% of the genome, even from the very first mouse paper, we knew that if we looked at the conservation of nucleotides across the genome, a lot more of the genome was being lovingly preserved by evolution over the course of 100 million years than could be accounted for by the protein coding sequences. In fact, we knew that about 6% of the genome was under nucleotide sequence conservation, meaning that the majority of what evolution was bothering to preserve was not protein coding information. It was likely regulatory information. Now, at the time, we could only put our fingers on a handful of those. With four mammals, we could get enough statistical re resolution, signal from noise, to pick out about half a million of those elements, covering about 1.6% of the genome. Now, with 29 mammals in a paper we recently published with others, uh, you can pick out about 3 million of those conserved elements across the genome. So what are they? Where are they? Well, one thing is, let's look at the most conserved non-coding elements. If you look at the most conserved sequences in the human genome that don't encode proteins and look at their distribution across the genome shown here in yellow and compare them to the distribution of proteins shown here in blue, you can see that the peaks tend to be actually in gene poor regions. The regions that have the most non-coding conservation are regions that have very few genes. Very few but not none. So if you look at what genes are in those regions, Strikingly, every one of those regions has an early developmental gene. And so the picture is roughly this, that there's an early important developmental gene here, and here's its protein coding piece, and here decorated around it, around the length of a megabase or so, are all of these non-coding elements that surround it and are presumably the regulatory elements necessary to correctly run an early developmental gene. So it switches our picture to the idea of a great deal of of regulatory control much more than we had imagined is what's important. You can begin to ask, um, how did this stuff get here, for example? When did this stuff get here? Well, you can actually answer that question by looking at elements that are conserved amongst all the placental mammals, but not conserved with the marsupial mammals. If so, those elements were invented during these 90 million years. And you could ask, what was invented here versus what was invented before? And learn about where's the action in mammalian evolution? And the answer is very clear. Most of the new invention is not protein coding. It's non-coding regulatory or other such things. That's the innovation that's been going on recently. In fact, most mammals have essentially the same protein coding genes, you know, mice and elephants and all that. And it's much more regulatory controls that make a difference. And, you can pick out that these regulatory control, like in between marsupials and eutherians, 
you can see that new ones are popping up interspersed in different places amongst there. Now, how do they happen? I mean, from the people who worry about evolution and how could evolution ever happen, wring their hands and say, well, how's evolution going to go invent, you know, 20 coordinate regulators around the genome that coordinately regulate these genes? Isn't that unlikely? Well, of course, these days with the internet, if you had a good idea, it, it could go viral very quickly. So it turns out that that, that actually, that notion of, of spreading good ideas virally is an old idea, and it's happened in the human genome as well. The human genome has these transposable elements I referred to that hop around the genome. A clever idea would be if, if, if an interesting regulator arose here, transposable elements might pick it up, scatter it around the genome, and in places where it was useful, it could be retained. And in other places, it would just degenerate. Just like with the internet, not all the places it goes is, is it picked up, but it's a good way to, to, to get a fully formed idea and spread it around the genome. So you might ask, of these innovations that happened in that 90 million years I was talking about, did they uh, get there by virtue of transposon distribution? And strikingly, at least 20% of them, and likely much more, you can clearly see are embedded in a transposon that brought them there. So it's clearly the case that while transposons are mostly junk and a burden on us and all that, we shouldn't think about them as parasites, but perhaps symbionts, because they are doing something useful for us. They are indeed a force of spreading evolutionary innovation around the genome. So anyway, that's one bit of, uh, you know, all these things come from just looking at the genome. It's kind of, it's kind of amazing what you can learn just by looking. Um, now, there's some things you can't learn just by looking. We actually have to do experiments and test things out and collect large-scale data in other ways. So I'll mention, of course, the power of interaction mapping, mapping locations on the genome, where certain proteins are sitting on the genome, or what parts of the genome are sitting near each other are things you can do once you have a basic genome scaffold. So around 2000, 2001, we knew virtually nothing about the three-dimensional architecture of the genome. Well, that's not totally true. We knew in a very theoretical, general way how things were wound up. So in general, we knew the various different levels of packing of DNA, but we couldn't say in particular with regard to any, any specific loci in the genome how they were arranged relative to each other. We just knew the general levels of packing. And of course, you could do fluorescent in situ hybridization. If you had two favorite loci, you could label them and see where they sat. But this was no way to put together the whole genome. So uh, around, um, 19, around 2002, Job Decker um, at the University of Massachusetts came up with a, a technique called uh, chromatin conformation capture, where you could take the genome, cross-link it into place, cut the DNA, and then ligate pieces of DNA together. And if two things were nearby in space, they'd be frozen there, they'd get cut, and they could get ligated. And then if you knew which pair of loci you're interested in, you could do a PCR reaction across them and see if they were nearby. So this was good if you knew the specific locus. Then that was 3C. He then had a way to do 4C that lets you do loci simultaneously, and 5C that lets you do more things simultaneously. But a graduate, a graduate student with me, um, uh, Eris Lieberman, a postdoc with me, Eris Lieberman uh, now, uh, did a beautiful, uh, had a beautiful idea, which was to skip the 6C, 7C, whatever, and do high C, which you may know is also the name of a drink. Anyway, he's, he's uh, so he did high C, and we did this in collaboration with Job which basically simply said, freeze the genome in place, cut it with a restriction enzyme, ligate it, and get all those fragments and sequence them with massively parallel sequencing and read everything simultaneously. That sounds extremely simple. It took about two years to actually make that work because you get a large number of artifacts and et cetera, and I won't sh I'm not going to share all of his pain with you, but he made it work. And then you could begin to ask, for every point i and j in the genome, how often are they near each other? Are they, often, are they near each other more than you'd expect on average or less than, than the average? And what you find out is that the genome is Scottish. So it turns out <laughs> that the, the genome is, is plaid in this way. It's very interesting. Now, what you'll see are red squares along the diagonal. That means regions, and everybody in that region, are near each other. 
But what this really is telling you is there are two compartments in the genome. Because the red compartments are near each other. And the red compartments are distant from the blue compartments. But these guys in blue compartments are near each other. So what it's really telling you is there's a class A and a class B. And guys in class A are near guys in class A. And guys in class B are near guys in class B. But A is more distant from B. That's what it means to have this nice Scottish plaid pattern here. So uh, this is true not just for chromosome 14 that I'm showing you, but it's true for all of, the, all of the chromosomes in the genome there, that you see the same kind of Scottish pattern. And it correlates, it turns out, with open and closed chromatin. The closed chromatin is one compartment. The open chromatin is another compartment. And uh, you can even tell that the closed chromatin is a little more closed because they're tighter to each other than the open is. And uh, Eris is going on now and looking much more deeply at substructures within that. But I'll tell you one thing emerged immediately that was mathematically kind of cool, which is there was a model that had been around for about 30 years of how the genome was supposed to pack, which was it's a long polymer, and a long polymer at equilibrium is known to fold into an equilibrium globule. And the equilibrium globule is the description of a long string that's had a long time to float around. And this is what it, and now the equilibrium globule turns out to be a, a mess. If you've ever had a ball of yarn and it gets really all caught up and you try to pull anything out, it gets caught. And that's the equilibrium globule state. It makes a beautiful testable prediction. The equilibrium globule, you can ask for any two points at distance d along the yarn, how far apart are they in three-dimensional space? And there's an exponent. And for the equilibrium globule, it's minus 1.5. So there's a simple exponent of the relationship between 1D distance in the genome and 3D distance in space. And you can test it. And it completely fails. In fact, the prediction of 1.5 is not satisfied at all. It's about minus 1.08. 1.08. That's interesting. So it isn't an equilibrium globule. It's way off an equilibrium globule. What it turns out it is, is it turns out it matches perfectly a fractal globule. A fractal globule is what happens if I take my yarn and I locally bunch up everything, and then I locally bunch up the bunches, and I locally bunch up those bunches. And then if I have a fractal globule and I pull any given point, it comes out very smoothly. It doesn't knot up turns out to be a much more sensible way to organize a genome. And this very nicely fits the fractal globule. Uh, you know, the exponent fits the fractal globule very nicely there. And so I think, in fact, that's what's going on. It's not a structured equilibrium at all. It's much more of a fractal structure. So you see those fun kind of things that emerge. Uh, there's also, you know, other, you know, interaction maps you can make for any protein or, or histone modification. As you, as you know, the genome is wrapped up in his, wrapped around histone proteins. The histone proteins have different covalent modifications. And if you have an antibody against a particular modification, you can use it to pull down the protein. And if you've cross-linked the protein to the DNA before you do that, you'll pull down the DNA that's attached to the protein that has that modification. You'll sequence it, lay it back on the scaffold, and you'll see where are those modifications in the genome. You could do that with either modifications of a histone. You could do that with the binding of any other protein that binds DNA. And there are zillions and zillions of these epigenomic maps of things that are sitting on top of the genome. So I'm going to mostly tell the story this morning of something that has emerged from some of that epigenomic looking. And particularly, I want to tell the story of these long intergenic non-coding RNAs. And this is work of a graduate student, Mitch Gutman, who's uh, now going on to start his own lab at Caltech, Jesse Eingrinds, and a good friend, John Rin, who is on the faculty at Harvard and has been a close collaborator. Aviv Regev has also been a collaborator on this. And so let me, let me just tell the story of one surprise that has emerged in the human genome that comes from this kind of looking. And I'll, here I'm going to really give you the full story of this one. So, uh, when we got the sequence of the whole genome, folks began looking for what parts of it were expressed into RNA. And they found that, boy, there was a lot of expression into RNA. It wasn't just the protein coding genes. There was RNAs made all over the place. Uh, it went from there being many to the virtually nihilistic position in the first ENCODE paper, 
that reported that essentially every nucleotide in the genome at some point is transcribed. Now at that point, of course, it becomes rather uninteresting because, like, maybe these transcripts don't mean anything. Maybe there's just no evolutionary pressure to absolutely avoid sometimes transcribing things, right? You have to say, great, so, it's, you know, because many of these transcripts that were getting reported were three logs lower in abundance than a typical gene. But there was a phase when everybody was into kind of everything's transcribed. So then you had to ask, well, but does it mean anything? And folks were struggling with how to, how to figure out if it means anything here. So are there any of these non-coding RNAs that are good for something? Well, I told you there were some that were known. There was the exist RNA involved in regulating the X chromosome, and one, one copy of the X chromosome. There was H19. There were, you know, a dozen or so long intergenic non-coding RNAs that really had function. And then there was, you know, uh, tons of transcriptions. How are you going to tell them apart? So the shaggy dog story starts like this. I told you that you could map epigenomic modifications. So one set of modifications that we mapped first were this modification called histone 3 lysine 4 trimethylation. And it occurs over the promoters of active genes. We also mapped this modification called histone 3 lysine 36 methylation. And that gets, that's present over the transcribed length of active protein coding genes. So if you see the green mark followed by the blue mark, it's the characteristic of an actively transcribed protein coding gene. So we had just built these maps. And Mitch Gutman started in the lab about a month later. And as his first project, I said, go through all the data and see if we missed any protein coding genes. That is, if there are any green, blue signatures that we hadn't previously known about. We had published a paper that had said there were about 21,000 protein coding genes, but I was perfectly happy that Mitch could find a few dozens or 100 or something that we had missed. So, you know, the, this works reasonably well. You can, you can sort of see all this stuff there. Uh, Mitch went through, and um, Mitch comes back, and he says, uh, I found some. I found a few thousand. So then you entertain two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, uh, the first year graduate student has just screwed up completely. <laughs> Hypothesis two, the first year graduate student has just made a pretty exciting discovery. You have to entertain both hypotheses and gather data to see which is the case. You know, so what he did, you know, he went through and he took the known ones, crossed them out, found the new ones, and he, he reported that across four mouse cell types, they found about 3,500 novel regions marked by this lysine 4, lysine 36 trimethylation. Uh, by today, this count has gone up to about 7,000 of these guys. Well, do these lysine 4, lysine 36 chromatin domains really encode functional non-coding RNAs, or are they something else? So you have to see, you know, do they make multi-exonic RNAs? Uh, they did. They do make multi-exonic RNAs. They're transcribed. They, they're, they're spliced. Are their sequences conserved? That would be a very good indication of function if you saw evolutionary conservation. Are their promoters conserved? Are their chromatin patterns conserved? But are you sure that they don't encode proteins? Let me just quickly run through the evidence on that. Uh, they do not show the conservation patterns that you expect from a protein. It's very clear. I told you that you could see these special patterns for protein conservation. They don't show them at all. For a protein coding gene, you get spikes wherever the protein coding exons are, and where there's no protein coding, you don't get that. Very clear. For a classical non-coding RNA, so, so you get a distribution to the right of that score. For a classical non-coding RNA like exist, you don't see any of those spikes. And so for the classical non-coding RNAs, they score very low. For some of our uh, new K4, K36 domains, they just look like exist there and they get a distribution there. And even for a tiny protein coding gene, like an 11 amino, like 11 amino acid peptides, you can still pick out. So it's not like there's little bits of protein coding that we would have missed. So they really truly don't encode proteins from the point of view, at least they don't look like encode proteins from the point of view of evolutionary conservation. They also don't look like it from their point, from their conservation within the human species, because even within the human species, one can, 
look at the patterns of these link RNAs and they don't show conservation in terms of the polymorphisms we see within the human population. So we have an evolutionary test between species, we have a test within species, there's no coding potential that we see. But they do show purifying selection. They really do show that as we look across species, they are not as conserved as protein coding genes, but they are much more conserved than the background. There's no question that they show a strong, evolutionarily significant conservation. The conservation is patchier than a protein coding gene, whereas protein coding genes show very tight conservation in their exons alone. Here in the exons of this, the conservation is very messy and patchy. And we'll come back to that. That's why they only show partial conservation. It's that you have good conservations in some parts, but not other parts. Their promoters are conserved. Good conservation of promoters. Their chromatin structures are conserved across species. They behave very nicely. So that's all good. Now, there's been a recent set of papers, in the, a recent paper in the last year that I think threw some confusion into this, which was people did, Jonathan Weissman and Nick Ingolia did beautiful work on ribosome profiling, where they examined whether, where ribosomes are actually located by pulling down ribosomes on messages. And what they found was that protein coding genes show ribosomes positioned across them, but so did these non-coding RNAs. Our alleged non-coding RNAs show ribosomes positioned across them. And they raise the possibility that actually these things are encoding proteins, despite all the evidence I've just told you. So Jonathan and, and Nick and Mitch and I went through this, and we actually have a paper coming out, and I'll just tell you roughly what it says, which is that, um, yes, indeed, protein coding genes show a very different pattern of ribosome occupancy than, say, three prime untranslated regions of protein coding genes. And when you look at our non-coding RNAs that I've told you about, they look like protein coding genes. They show the ribosome <coughs> occupancy of protein coding genes. But that shouldn't necessarily bother you, because so do five prime untranslated regions. That's the control, is they look a lot like five prime untranslated regions. See, five prime UTRs look like these. And what you really should be thinking, and I'll show you some more evidence of this in a second, is that ribosomes hop on messages and don't know if they're going to be translated, and they scan. And what you're really watching is a non-coding RNA still gets a ribosome hopping on it and scanning it very often. And it looks like a five prime untranslated region. So uh, in any case, classical non-coding RNAs also have ribosomes that are associated with them. So we ended up coming up with a, a nice way between Nick and, and Jonathan and Mitch and we that said the real hallmark of protein, of translation into a protein is that when you come to the stop codon after you've been translating, the ribosome falls off sharply. And it's the sharpness of fall off between occupancy and non-occupancy that is a hallmark. And so um, basically if we now on this scale have that sharp fall off, I'm just going to say, I'm going to just jump right through here, that protein coding regions show the sharp fall off, a ribosome release, a sharp fall off. Nothing else does. Not five prime UTRs, not three prime UTRs, not link RNAs, not nothing. And that this is the real hallmark of whether something encodes a protein. So in fact, we have a paper coming out with Jonathan and Nick on this very topic there. So um, anyway, long story short, the RNA sequences are conserved, they encode multi-exonic RNAs, the RNA sequences are conserved, the promoters are conserved, the chromatin's conserved, but they are absolutely not protein coding things with the usual caveat that a few percent surely encode proteins, but for the most part, they don't encode proteins. So what do they do? What do these things do? Well, to figure out what they do is hard because you have like thousands of them. And so the first thing you do is you start with a genomic approach and you ask, what genes are they co-associated with, co-expressed with? And so a kind of guilt by association approach. Uh, look at the expression of all these RNAs across lots of different tissues and, um, you know, see what they correlate with. And when you do that, you find some of them are correlated with, you know, immune responses and stem cell pluripotency. And, you know, you have some guesses now of what they do. But, of course, correlation is not the same thing as proof of function. 
because it's possible that, of course, they're being expressed in tandem with these things um, because they, by chance, have some related regulators in the region. You've got to actually show function. So the only way to show function to a geneticist is to knock it out and show me that when you knock it out, you get an effect. So Mitch decided to do that. There are about 238 of these guys who are expressed in embryonic stem cells. And he made, he decided to pick as his system embryonic stem cells, because they're good for all sorts of reasons. And he, he made uh, RNAi constructs, uh, short hairpin RNAs, against these 238 non-coding RNAs and saw what happened. And I'm going to summarize a lot of data that, uh, that he has as follows. For starters, when you knock them down, about 90% of them, when you knock them down, have clear effects on gene expression, properly controlled here. We've controlled this in the right way with, with scrambled constructs and looked at things and asked, are the same levels of knockdown as proteins? And so about 90% have clear knock effects on gene expression, similar to knocking down protein coding genes. 26 of them are essential for maintaining pluripotency, good sign of function, and about 30 of them are necessary to repress ES cells from going down immediately some differentiation pathway, another good sign of function. In addition, if you look at the promoters of these genes, they are bound by the transcription factors found in ES cells, the special uh, transcription factors, factors of ES cells. When you knock down these transcription factors, the, the classic you know, OCT4s and SOX2s and NANOGs, you affect the transcription of these link RNAs. And when the ES cells differentiate, these guys go down. So again, they show all the right hallmarks there. Now what are they doing? Well, they bind to diverse proteins across the genome. Uh, we have a lot of data now where using antibodies against different chromatin regulatory proteins, we can pull them down and find that many of these link RNAs are bound to chromatin readers and writers and erasers and other things that are connected to gene expression. And then when I knock down one of these chromatin regulators and I knock down the associated link RNA, we see overlap in their effects on the genome. So again, indicating that they have similar functions. I've just summarized the huge pile of data that I'm not actually giving you. I'm just waving my hands and telling you this. But uh, in any case, it's, it's, it's been published, and, and there it is. So what do we think these guys are doing? Our best guess is the following, that they act as scaffolds, modular, flexible scaffolds, and that if I wanted to assemble a protein complex, I could go to a lot of evolutionary work to make these proteins fit perfectly with each other. But another way would be for each of them to have a binding site to RNA. And then I make an RNA that can bind to all three of them. Then they're now in close proximity to each other and it's much simpler to make a complex out of them. I need a lot less specificity to do that. But if I then wanted to make a different complex in the next cell type, I could make a different link RNA. So the idea of generic binding sites or, or binding sites to RNAs and then being able to assemble link RNAs that are modular scaffolds would be a cool thing. We know at least one example. Telomerase RNA works this way. Telomerase RNA is a scaffold for three proteins that come together into the telomerase complex. So it's not entirely crazy that that could be the case. So you know, the idea would be that in certain cell types, a given RNA is made and it organizes a bunch of proteins. And in a different cell type, a different RNA is made, and it organizes a different bunch of proteins. And that, that could be one of the things it's doing, is being a nice organizer of proteins in that way. And so that, uh, you know, it, it could be directing things to particular places in the genome or other things like that. I'll come back and say some more things about what link RNAs could be doing. You know, it could be assembling, sitting down, putting marks on, et cetera. So all right, so um, we decided that in order to figure out what these link RNAs are doing with respect to regulation in the genome, which isn't the only thing they could be doing, but we, we needed to know where they were sitting. So I told you that we could figure out where proteins were sitting in the genome. Could we figure out where link RNAs are sitting in the genome? So we needed to develop a way to figure out where link RNAs are sitting. And this graduate student lab, Jesse Eingrinds, has just developed a way of localizing link RNAs in the genome. So um, let me just briefly describe how this works. 
we think if, if these link RNAs are somehow organizing proteins, and sometimes those proteins are doing things in the genome, then they're going to be associated with particular places in the genome. How do we find them? Well, Jesse developed a nice technique called RAP. Um, take cells, cross-link everything, like we've been talking about, and then make a probe consisting of large pieces of antisense RNA, 120 mers, covering the entire message. Large. People tried to do this before, and the results had been rather messy because they'd use small probes covering just portions of the sequence. We said large probes, whole sequence, all the way. Then use those probes to pull down the messages and see what DNA is associated with them. So probes against the RNA and see what DNA comes down with them. This Mac can't connect to iCloud, but I don't care. I don't know. Actually, I'm going to say... But I don't want to say, yeah, I got to, uh, yeah, I know, but the problem is I'm not seeing this here. I have to escape to see that. Where'd that go? Oh, there it is, later. Back to slideshow. Okay. Yes, very good. So, in any case, it works. If you do this, it's highly specific to which RNA you're pulling down. And if you do it with exist, the RNA that coats the inactive X chromosome, it pulls down the X chromosome, and it doesn't pull down anybody else. So since this was our control, we figured we'd really try to study exist. And I just want to tell you what Jesse has learned about where this particular link RNA is and what we can learn about this famous link RNA, which has been known for a long time, by just looking at where it's sitting. Now you know it sits on the, X chrom the inactive X chromosome in females. But the truth is, nobody really knew much more than that. Because if you, if you hybridize to it, you see it coats the inactive X chromosome. But like, is it sitting at discrete locations? Or is it kind of broadly covering it? Apart from doing it by in situ hybridization, we really didn't have much of a picture. So the localization here, using this localization technique, can tell us where exist is. So he was able to see that. For the most part, he can see pretty uniform coverage across the entire chromosome, for starters. Every 10 kilobase window, 85% of the 10 kilobase windows show at least tenfold enrichment uh, of, of exist, and not a single thing on an autosome shows that much enrichment. Now, uh, you know, the regions here that are most covered correlate with the distribution of this. Oh, oh, so exist, I have to remind you, exist inactivates the X chromosome by bringing with it a protein, the, the polycomb repressive complex, that puts on a repressive mark, K27, and exist correlates now with where the K27s are. There are um, certain regions that have very low exist. They correspond to the genes that escape X inactivation. That's kind of cool. So the general pattern of exist fits our expectations. It's present on the X and not elsewhere, highly enriched. It's very well distributed, but there are some places where it's very missing, and those are the relatively small places that escape X inactivation. The other question is, how did it get there? How did exist manage to distribute itself across the X chromosome? Well, we can explore that now. How did this pattern get set up? Well, to do that, you would have to kind of have a dial and turn on exist. So um, you can do that. If you take a male cell in which exist is not normally on, and you put it on a transgene that you can control, you can induce it. And it can begin to spread. Now, after several days, the cell will die because you're going to inactivate the only X chromosome that it has. But from zero to six hours, you can collect a lot of data on its spread. And Jesse did that. And he watched it spread from just being at its own locus to spreading out and out and out across the chromosome. And he can ask a lot of cool questions. Like one question is, does it spread just uniformly out? Or does it kind of jump to locations? Like, does it spread out in some just linear process along the chromosome? Or is it jumping to certain locations? Well, here's the data at three hours. It's jumping. It's very clearly jumping to some locations. Now, which locations is it jumping to? Who's there at those locations? 
One, one hypothesis, it's specific DNA sequences that are attracting it. We analyze the hell out of it, and it's not. We can see no evidence of specific DNA sequences there. So what's another hypothesis? Another hypothesis is those are the locations that are nearby in three-dimensional space. Remember, we talked about the three-dimensional locations in the genome. So maybe, in fact, what it is, is it's spreading to the guys who are nearby in three-dimensional space. Now, as it happens, we have maps of three dimensions, which I told you about just before. So we can correlate the map of exist to the map of three-dimensional space, and they correlate beautifully. It's jumping in three-dimensional space there, and you can see that there. Now, if you really want to believe it, you could take the transgene and move it to a different part of the chromosome and show me that when it's sitting over here, it shows the pattern for three-dimensional space again, which would rule out the sequence idea completely, and it does. When you move it over there, it shows the pattern for three-dimensional space that's appropriate for sitting over there. So the kind of notion is that it's making RNAs, and the RNAs are spreading nearby and creating some kind of a zone of inactivation. Now, I'm going to very briefly say that there are a few regions that don't fit the pattern, where at three hours, you see that it's nearby, but hasn't, doesn't have a lot of exist. Nearby, but doesn't have a lot of exist. Very briefly, I'll tell you, those are regions that have active transcription. And that exist, when it comes along to those regions there, because the regions are being actively transcribed, has a harder time establishing itself. Exist comes in and brings with it that repressive complex, but until it's repressed, it has a hard time really coding it. And we know this because we have done the following experiment, where we have taken a version of EXIST that lacks the binding site for the repressive complex, and it now has a really hard time ever establishing itself well. So what's happening is it gets there, starts repressing, and only when it's repressed well is it really coding well. So what you should imagine is roughly a, whoops, sorry, a picture like this. The RNAs spread. There we go. And then, for Star Trek fans, you know, it's kind of like, it's the tractor beam. That, that it begins to spread, it begins to repress, it begins to condense the chromosome, and as it condenses the chromosome, it then brings in further, in, so it's condensing, spreading, and then it, then it spreads out further and continues to condense and draw other things into it. And when it didn't have that repressive bit, a loop will be hanging out there. Anyway, I've gone on too long about that, but let me just say, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff. There are 7,000, at least, genes that encode RNAs that don't encode proteins that we had no idea about before we had a human genome, and we can only stumble upon when we can take these kind of global looks. And our guess is that they are scaffolding other proteins. Um, and that, in some cases, they're exploiting architecture to get things done, but I'm sure they're a lot cleverer than that. Because these RNAs can function by interacting with proteins, they could, in theory, interact with DNA, they could, in theory, interact with other RNAs, and, in theory, they're pretty easy to evolve. It's easy to make new ones. And it turns out that most of these genes have the, the property that they're much more tissue-specific and much more recently evolved than protein coding genes, so we think of them as a dynamic part of regulation. But in principle, there's a whole lot of different things that these things can do. They can, for example, as we say, be modular scaffolds. We do know in the ribosome that the RNA can play a catalytic role, and I bet it's not the last place that catalysis is going to get used. We know that it can play a, temp a role of being a template, as happens in, the, in telomerase. It's a, tr it's a template for putting on telomeres. We, I suspect it can get used as a recruiter of complexes to particular locations. There's now a little bit of evidence of RNAs acting as allosteric modifiers of proteins or, or as elements to titrate proteins away from sites. So anyway, that's a whole class of genes, and we know stunningly little about this class of genes, and there's a lot of interest now about these link RNAs. But more generally, I think what it does is it makes the case that we need deep catalogs of everything. This is the wonderful tension between genomics, large scale, let's work together to get huge data sets and put them in the hands of everybody. And then 
Once there are huge data sets in the hands of everybody, smart people can see things in huge data sets and then pursue specific experiments. And that was the idea of the Genome Project in the first place, and I don't think we're close to done with that. We need communal efforts to generate data, and then smart people figuring out what to do with those data. So that's the main thing for today. I'm going to just tell you that tomorrow's talk is going to cover disease. It's going to cover the understanding of inherited disease and cancer. I'm going to talk about how we discover genes across the genome. I'll tell you about what, what we've done you know, as, a, as a world since 2001 in Mendelian diseases here and what's still ahead. I'm going to discuss the basis of common disease and how we've gone from knowing few, I'm just going to, this is a preview, an advertisement if anybody wants to come, um, you know, how we've gone from knowing very few of the genes involved in common diseases to knowing large numbers of genes involved in common diseases from a simple idea to being able now to get, I'm just going to say, more than 2,000 loci. And I'll talk about some of the important and exciting discoveries that have come from that and also some of the challenges that remain ahead about how to do those things. And then um, I guess, there we go. I'm going to talk about cancer, mapping the cancer genome and what we have learned from mapping the cancer genome, the results from more than 3,000 tumors that have been analyzed to date and the new classes of genes. And I'm going to talk about mapping human history and what new things we have learned about mapping human history from the human genome. So anyway, that's, that's just to let you know what will be there if you want to. And if not, you'll catch it on the web or not as you mean. So this is sort of what we've done today, the evolution of the genome and some funky functional elements and other things in the genome. This is what's on board for tomorrow. And I particularly with regard to today's talk, want to uh, acknowledge some particular colleagues who, who have been central to genome sequencing and cross-species analysis and to the 3D maps, Eris Lieberman, Job Decker, and, and Ninka Berkham. Uh, and on the cross-species analysis, uh, Shashtan Lindblad To, uh, Manolis Kalis, Tarjay Mickelson, and Michelle Clamp. And then on this RNA story, which I decided I would just tell you a bunch about, Mitch Gutman, who is really the person who, who stumbled upon rather brilliantly all these things, uh, and is starting his own lab at Caltech, and Jesse Eingrinds, who has been doing this localization of RNAs and now has a cool tool where you can do this to many, many more RNAs. And our collaborators, Catherine Plath and, and Amy Panja Jones at UCLA, uh, who have been particularly important on that EXIST experiment. And no genomics talk is appropriate without the acknowledgement uh, that all genomics involves a whole world working together. And we rely on data produced by many, many, many people all over the world. And that's what makes the field so much fun. So I shall stop there and take any questions.